<laughs> I still can't believe I did that. <laughs> All right. We're going to get past it. We're going to get past it. Welcome to another episode of The Inciting Event, a podcast where I talk to people that I want to talk to without all the plotting and scripting and interviewing, just people talking about books, writing, stage and screen, music, and any form of art that inspires us with no real plan to speak of. It's random, it's fun, it's a little chaotic, and hopefully entertaining to people not involved in said chaos. That being you, I'm your host, Zachary Steele, and on today's show, I am Pleased to be joined by good friend and writer Kevin Howarth. Hey, Kevin, how you doing? I'm doing good, Zach. How are you? How are you doing? I've, I've been doing pretty good. Oh, uh, goodness. Um, well, it's good to talk to you again. It's been a while. Yeah, it has been a while. A very, very long while. Yes. Um, no, I was thinking. I was thinking the other day about the uh, the the top 500 albums that you your favorite albums that you ranked gonna make sure we were very specific that it was your favorite albums not the top 500 <laughs> albums um no, it, it is funny favorite. just on that note though it's like it was funny like it was just I, mean, I couldn't have picked a more supposedly innocuous project to do where it's just like oh for two years i'm gonna just gonna share my top 500 favorite albums with people and it was funny i i, I had a spidey sense early on to sort of say like let me call it the top 500 favorite albums because yeah. inevitably when i started the list there were some i mean there weren't many people but there were the occasional people on my facebook friend list that were just like why did you rank merciful fate over the beatles i mean sergeant peppers is this better album that and i had to keep telling people like okay, favorite is different than objective like obviously yeah sergeant peppers objectively is a better album than a, an obscure metal band but in terms of influence and cultural impact favorite favorite yeah. so so yeah it was weird that that something that was that innocuous it's like people would sort of think that i was trying to be like the the word of god on things and i think ultimately you know unless you're like doing an objective academic list it's like i think anybody you know talking about your favorite albums i think is the better way to go because then you don't really get into arguments with people it's sort of like it's like you know i can't argue with like your opinion zach you know for example it's like you know like you might have some favorite albums that are not mine who cares because it's like Music is so subjective anyway. It's like, you know, unless you're like, you know, aligned with the academics, we're all going to have our different favorite albums, you know? Yes, but I, I, I don't know if it's just because you don't spend as much time on social media as I do. But <laughs> yes, Kevin, people can have opinions about your opinions. <laughs> yeah, they seem to get and, mean on social media. They, I don't know why. Very, they are very, very eager to express to you how your opinion is wrong. Yeah. And so, yeah, I'm sure you took some flack on that. I mean, regardless of what you called it, because people are, <laughs> they've, got, they've got feelings. Which, by the way, Merciful Fate, they are objectively better than the Beatles, though. I will say that. Okay. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's like, <laughs> delete. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'll goodness. start an argument I, immediately on the podcast. That's what I'm I know. That's what I do. Just like, I just, just start it right here and just have an argument about this. Um, <laughs> the funny thing is, it's like, cause this was in um, 2000. 16 17 well it was it was uh, i started it in 2014 yeah because i did i did a post every weekday for two years and it took way longer than I, well mathematically i knew that's kind of how it would have worked but mm -hmm. it was interesting though like the the beginning of the project my essays were very very short uh because i did it via blog post i would share a blog post for each favorite album and there were very tiny essays to begin with. And then by the time I ended, I was writing like epic, like 7,000 word essays about my favorite albums and stuff like that. So it got out of hand. Wait, wait, end, wait. But... I just want to make sure I got this right. You were using a lot of words to describe something? Yes. I was very verbose, which <laughs> people are like shocked about. <laughs> Kevin verbose? Uh, so um, <laughs> I actually just curious, um, is that still out there? that list it it is um the the only reason you can find it on facebook the, the only reason i made it a little bit hard to find is because uh a lot of the essays especially toward the end got very very personal 
And it's sort of like one of those half and half things where I'd rather Google is not indexing it and showcasing it to the world. But at the same time, if somebody wants to dig a little bit on Facebook and find it, it's there. So that may, that may change in the future if I kind of maybe re-edit it or, or you know, kind of revise it or do something to it. But, but I, I kind of keep it under the radar screen just because it got very personal toward the end. And I think it ended up to be more of a vanity project for me rather than something that I really wanted to share with the wide, wide world of the internet kind of a thing. Yeah. So in other words, we don't want any more opinions about your very personal list. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want people arguing with me about why I shouldn't like nine inch nails or something like that. So. Oh, okay. Well then, then let's, let's get people to argue about what your number one was. Well, yeah. Um, well, let's see, see, this is where it gets interesting because like, like my number one favorite album, um, it kind of, you know, doing the project caused me to kind of challenge the whole notion, like, you know, what, ma what makes a favorite album? You know, because there's a lot of circumstances and, th and things like that in a lot of context that can go into that. And yeah, because obviously, you know, I, I, you know, there's objectively good albums, you know, like Dark Side of the Moon, nobody's going to argue about that, but that only ended up like maybe 93 on my list. Um, but there's a lot of times where like some, an album that where you, you, you yourself might even know that it's not the, the best, best of all time might mean something to you. So it gets re really ranked really high. Um, uh, but in this case, it, it actually was an acclaimed album that was number one, but also an odd one because it was an album that really only had like a like a meteoric impact during my senior year of high school like it was it was it kind of saved me that year but then post 1995 i probably it's never been like a go to album because it's almost too raw and angry and that's the downward spiral by 9 inch nails so it's one of those albums where i almost had to do a lot of um contextualizing when I communicated that after people had waited two years for the number one album, because I wanted to let them know this is not an album I listen to every day as a, you know, person, you know, who's like almost at the time, almost 40, but in terms of impact, like just like impact on my life compared to any other album I could think of, it had to be number one, just because it, it was, it, there was, I can't think of another album, even to this day of um, where, the emotional impact, the immediate resonance with the with the album helped me through a very difficult time. Just like like you know, it was very cathartic. It allowed it, it it allowed me to get out a lot of negative thoughts in a healthy way instead of doing it another way. You know, so right. it was just like very. So so even to this day, it's like I, I just can't think of another album that was that emotionally resonant with me and in, in that intense of a way. And I think the intensity made it number one, I think. so. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I don't know how you did that because, I mean, the thought of building any kind of list like that just gives me anxiety. I had a, uh, <laughs> I mean, I didn't have I didn't have anything like that when I was a kid. I had a tape case that was like, uh, I don't know, I feel like it was like 48 on the top and 48, maybe it was 96. So it was like flip. And it was a really cool case, zip, zip. I could take it anywhere. And I um, mean, I always had it filled because I had lots of cassettes because that was the era that I came from. There were no compact discs, the whatever those are. Um, but I used to, um, in my early 20s still, I, I used to do a sort of, you know, top best of sort of a la Casey Kasem's top 40. And um, I would base it on the number of plays that I had uh, for that for that week. And and I, I just would move it around. So if I played it, I moved something up. And, uh, and the more that it got played, the more that I got moved up. And, uh, and I wound up with like two, di two different ones. One, I'm okay to admit. The other one, I'm a little ashamed to admit. Um, but uh, it was Skid Row, Youth Gone Wild, that was always like number one. And, and it was hard to dethrone it because I kept wanting to listen to it. Um, then there was that brief period of time where, of all things, Nelson bumped them from the number one um, after the rain. And uh, wasn't that what it was called? I don't know. That was after actually the rain. Yeah, that was actually one of my favorite called. songs in like middle school. And <laughs> they they were so awesome at the time. It's still I I, I think it's still a good song, but yeah. Yeah. No, I mean they're yeah. extremely talented. It's just a couple yeah. of blonde boys singing, um, yeah. like you know the rock version of boy bands. Um, but uh, but yeah, they were the only ones to really challenge Skid Row for a while. But I I I can't imagine if you asked me to put my five hundred, even if we qualified it with favorite, I would still have difficulty because I would voice on behalf of other people like no why is that ranked there when this one should be up 
<laughs> never right. get there. I would never get there. So well, I if I had to that. pressure you though, like like what, even if you can't come up with like one, maybe two or three, like like what, like like sort of forcing you in a corner, like what would you have to say, like your favorite? Album? So we're gonna learn. We're gonna learn right here that my answer changes every day because um, this and this is why I could never do it. Um, because I'll 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 try to narrow it down for the sake of this conversation to three that were kind of my go-tos. And and again, I'll, I'll say the same thing. They're not, I don't think these are the greatest albums ever, but they are certainly albums that I loved. Um obviously Youth Gone Wild being one of them. Um, and that not just because I love the sound and the music itself, but the lyrics, but um because if I could if I could suddenly have any one singer's voice, it would be Sebastian Box, because um, he's just an incredible vocalist. Yeah. Um, and I always, as you know, I always qualify here with like, wasn't a big fan of him on Gilmore Girls because I felt like that didn't work. <laughs> but you know, go Sebastian, get your get your paycheck. Yeah. Um, so so definitely that one. My my road trip album that was an absolute must every time I started a road trip was um, Jagged Little Pill. Um, again, Alanis Morissette is a, a, an amazing vocalist, um, and I, the the lyrics and the the music all together, I just absolutely love it. And then um, after Jagged Little Pill, um, tough. Okay, so I I, I want to say Doctor Feelgood today, because Doctor Feelgood was even though I was already listening to hard rock, heavy metal at this time. Um, I don't know. There was, there was something about the music on that album that um, I just, it it's, I still to this day will put when I need a boost, I will still put on kickstart my heart. Um, yeah. If I need to, and if I need to follow up with anything else, you know, there's plenty on that album to do it. Um, it was just such a great mix of really like pure rock sound and um and then some of the commercial feel as well so today that's yeah. my response well you know what's interesting about the just kind of riffing off of two of the albums the, the ones that are kind of similar so so skid row that album came out uh in 89 dr feelgood came out in 89 what's mm -hmm. interesting about that time is that um it was an interesting time for like glam metal because it sort of had like this arc of maybe 10 years from like maybe 83 to about 93 mm -hmm. and for, for me it kind of started with you know pyromania shout out the devil rats out of the cellar in 84 that was kind of the beginning kind of went through this like glammed up period where a lot of the bands wore makeup obviously you know you know in, until you know i think there was like a watershed where like appetite for destruction sort of came out wiped out the makeup for everybody and then it sort of led to this interesting period where and this is why I get a little angry sometimes when people knock a lot of the hair metal or glam metal. I always call them glam metal because hair metal is a little disparaging, I think. Uh, I mean, it's funny. Well, I mean, I'm offended by anything to do with hair, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but, but what's interesting, though, is like um, Skid Row and Motley Crue around that time sort of it was like an interesting period where a lot of the glam metal bands sort of like toughened up in the wake of appetite for destruction. And they had this kind of like very, I don't know, like I liked that sound of a lot of the, like the hard rock around that time. And one of the biggest shames to me is that whether it's, you know, that music hasn't really found a home on like classic rock radio or alternative radio. It's like, you know, the alternative rock radio or mainstream rock radio. And it was some really good music during that time because I think a lot of those bands that, you know, they took off their makeup, they, they sort of, they stopped with a lot of their posturing and you got some really good albums out of those bands that had like a really like bluesy hard rock foundation. But basically Skid Row, um, you know, was one of those bands that, you know, they, they, they came in, they came into the, the, to the scene late, but their debut album was amazing. Slave to the Grind is amazing from 91. Mm -hmm. I'll even go further. Subhuman Race from 1995 is an amazing album. And and then you have Motley Crue that sort of, you know, they, they just changed things around, you know, in 87. They had um, the Girls, Girls, Girls album where they sort of toughened up. Mm -hmm. Wild Side is an amazing song. But yeah, Dr. Feelgood was just like a peak for them where they just they were firing on all cylinders on that album. Yeah. And just they, and they also, having all mostly, I think, all of them sobered up, they just had a really like 
they just seemed together and with it and just <laughs> firing all cylinders. They had focus. Yeah. yeah and and, the, and they also put on just amazing concerts. Um, doesn't matter which, which album it was. I mean, you know, they, they knew how to put on a show, but no, they were, they were, they were kind of peak um, claim metal, as you call it. Um, yeah. But, well, I can say too, like, like at, um, at the, I saw them last year, there was this big mega show at Truist Park. Uh, it was uh, Def Leppard, Motley Crue, Poison, Joan Jett, I understand. and and one jealous friend. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yes. And, and what's what's funny about that is that uh, like like Joan Jett kicked ass. Poison was a fan favorite. Def Leppard was a little like too professional almost, like when they were good. But, but Motley Crue, there's just a sense of danger about them. Like they get on stage, yes, that's fair. You just don't know what's going to happen, and it's like the, mm -hmm. you can you can feel it. It's palpable. And they just have this edge that that very few bands can kind of come on with an atmosphere like that live. Like 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 mm -hmm. the only ones I can kind of think of sometimes are like, you know, Kiss has that a little bit. Uh, uh, you know, very few bands have that kind of atmosphere. Slayer has that a little bit. Corn has that in different. I mean, obviously different ways, but but it's just there's certain bands that just they, they just bring something intangible to the stage experience, and it's just. Mm -hmm magical so yeah molly crew definitely has that and, and i didn't really know that until i saw him live and and even right. recently they still have that danger and edge to them which is fascinating i know right and they just do the craziest stuff um no now you got me thinking about like concerts that, that i went to in that era um i saw cinderella which cinderella was a great band and great live but they kind of made you feel like you know, you weren't really in a concert. You were more like in a, a blues hall or something like that. It was something intimate the way that they did it. Um, yeah. White Lion was in that particular one. Oh. And um, I think they were very much studio sound on stage, but very good. Um, yeah. I saw Warrant and Poison three different times. Wow. Um, I think Warrant was probably the ones that they weren't, they didn't have the era, the feeling of danger to them. They just had that kind of, frat boy vibe like you weren't sure what they were going to say or what crude thing they were going to do next um and they usually didn't disappoint in that regard uh yeah but um of course warrant is a sad story too because you know um i mean they got tagged for cherry pie as like this is who you are and it's like oh my god you i remember we've talked about this before janie lane in an interview um getting so frustrated because he was always called the cherry pie guy when in fact there was all this other great music that they wrote including on that same album um uncle tom's cabin which was was a great piece of storytelling and and good rock sound yeah. um so so yeah but um yeah that kind of haunted a lot of those bands around that time where it's like they they unfortunately and especially like in the mtv slash top 40 era you know, there mm -hmm. wasn't a lot of channels for them to kind of just, you know, have like some of the, you know, their deeper album tracks respected or played. So a lot of times you had these bands that sometimes had really deep discographies. They had really good, you know, good music beyond the hits. And they just got people just remember them for the hits, you know, like, like, like Mr. Big, I think, suffered from that. Yeah. They were like a very, like Dead a very with you. Heavy band. I mean, they were. They had like you know, like like Billy Sheehan in the band. It was like doing amazing stuff. And mm -hmm. all all people remember is to be with you. That's all they remember. Uh, Extreme got hit with that. I know that's uh, one of our favorite bands. Uh, yes, both you absolutely. and I. Did. But they only got remembered for more than words and maybe wholehearted a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. You know, yeah. And so so Warrant was, um, I think, one of those victims of those bands during that time. One of the glam metal bands that got defined by a hit or two and some of their best work. And I, and I think, you know, you and I have talked before about one of their albums from like the, like 92 or 93 that mm -hmm. actually had like, while grunge was raging, Warrant did some of their best work on that album. And it's just, I, I think a lot of, a lot of the, uh, the glam metal bands put out some of their best work actually strangely in like 92 or 93 while no one cared. I think Cinderella had a great album during that time. Extreme had three sides to every story. Uh, a masterpiece in my mind, you know, um, yeah. but nobody cared. Nobody cared because yeah. uh, just the musical taste had changed so much. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like that at that particular era that, or at that particular time that the bands that were really good storytellers and 
could like construct something that was kind of timeless or were still able to do stuff while the the rest of them sort of faded you know there were all kinds of bands that had just popped up that I liked like Firehouse and Trickster and oh, yeah. And, yeah. and others like that that I mean I obsessively listened to um and they just like one or two albums and they were gone because people wanted to listen to Pearl Jam and Soundgarden and everything Nirvana and everything that was popping up out of the the Pacific Northwest yeah what's interesting is that that the, the shame of it all sometimes is with with some of these bands and, and genres is that uh you know the public kind of moves on from thing to thing you know if there was a while where you know glam metal was very popular in the late 80s early 90s then grunge took over then another thing takes over and it's sort of ironic that just at the time that um some of these bands are creating their most mature works that would be the most interesting to the public the public's moved on you know like extreme yeah. had you know, three sides of every story, nobody cared by that point. You know, Warrant had a great album, nobody cared by that point. But you see yeah. that through a lot of different eras, you know, like like the 60s and 70s are kind of like that a little bit where, you know, there was, um, you know, psych heavy psychedelic music got sort of like, you know, eradicated by, you know, early 70s hard rock that was a little bit cleaner and more straightforward. Then that got upended by punk and disco. Punk and disco got upended by 80s pop, synth pop and things like that. There's just always things that sort of like, the public just moves on so fast that sometimes you know like an artist is just about ready to come into their stride and then they get left behind you know so right no no it's it's really crazy um yeah i'm, I'm curious um because we, we talk about extreme and i feel like my every time we talk about extreme my entire like musical mind stops because i still feel like they're they're one of the most underrated bands and oh. Um, and, and also not just the band itself, but like Nuno Betancourt as a guitarist, I feel like they're, they're just collectively, oh, yeah. they're all just really, really underestimated. And, and what, what band is on that list for you? So criminally underrated bands. Yeah. Um, well to stay within metal just for a second and around that time, actually, I think one, one of the most criminally underrated bands for me is the band Sabotage. Um, they had... Uh, now, hardcore metal people will, will all know sabotage like that. They're they're canonized within the hardcore metal community, but outside of that, they don't have anywhere near the name recognition that even casual people would have for like Metallica or Megadeth or Anthrax or Slayer or anything like that. Um, sabotage was very innovative and in, and in, and basically taking like almost like operatic progressive metal creating like these very vivid storylines. They were very deep storytellers, had a lot of emotional resonance in their music. There's, there's a lot of like just things that kind of hit me in the gut about a lot of their music. Like, for example, they had an album called Gutter Ballet in 1989, where they basically just talk about something that most musicians don't talk about. Like one of their songs is called like When the Crowds Are Gone. Like what happens when the peak moment is over? And they're singing about it. They're, they have songs about like what happens when the crowd goes away. Or there's a, there's an album that's actually in my top 500 favorite albums. I ranked it number 10. It's called Streets of Rock Opera. And to me, it's one of the most profound meditations on basically just going off the rails, losing, you know, losing your shit, and then kind of coming back from that, you know, and, and sort of it's, it's almost like a, you know, if you, you know, for those who are like, you know, struggled with like maybe alcohol abuse or drug addiction or something like that. It's got that kind of arc to it where it's like, you sort of like lose yourself and then find yourself again. It's an album of salvation and it's very profoundly told, but it's also got great heavy metal music. And they released about six albums kind of like that with the depth and, you know, the emotional depth, the storytelling and, and but it's also still head banging heavy metal. Nobody cares. You know, it's like, they just kind of did all this with no mainstream recognition and the, the irony there is that this is the same group of people that created Trans-Siberian Orchestra, which everybody does love. That's crazy. Like just fancy Christmas music. And it's just like, I'm not knocking it. It's it's made, it's given them a good paycheck. But to me, yeah. the real meat to that band was Sabotage. Like the Sabotage albums are just great. Yeah. So yeah, I'd say, I don't, I, I had never yeah. heard of them. I'll have to, I'll have to look that up because I had never heard of them. But it's funny you tell that story and all I can think is like Oingo Boingo to Danny Elfman doing Tim Burton. Oh, yeah soundtracks you know kind of the same way it's like i don't think most people who are familiar with like the epic batman soundtrack from the early 90s would even ever relate that to oingo boingo and i certainly wouldn't ever relate 
Trans-Siberian Orchestra to hard rock, heavy metal, whatever. Yeah. So, um, so I have to look that up. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, but that definitely comes to mind as like like the, like a standout um, criminally underrated band. Uh, another one I'll mention, just one that's more recent from the 21st century, is um, this band that I that I I was a fan of the, from day one. They were called School of Seven Bells, and just it's just really great songwriting. It's almost like a kind of a combination of if you like My Bloody Valentine, you sort of take their dream pop landscapes kind of maybe make it a little bit more pop oriented, but still experimental and interesting and weird. It kind of has this atmospheric world that they create that sounds very much, you know how like some bands, you can kind of go into their world, so to speak, you know, like, like, like Trent Reznor sometimes talk about the cure that way. You can go into the world of the cure and live there. Well, School Seven Bells kind of has that. It's like a world they create. You can kind of enter and, and, and just beautiful vocals, um, excellent songwriting, they had four just masterpiece albums, well reviewed, but I never, whatever I've mentioned them to somebody, 99 times out of 100, nobody's heard of them. You know, it's just one of those bands that just went under the radar for some reason, even though they had a great body of work. So I'd say that's a more recent example of a criminally underrated band from, from my side. So School of Seven oh, that's Bells. Interesting. That's interesting. Um, it's funny, just like I, as we're going through this, I start remembering all the bands that I listened to during the late eighties, early nineties, that just kind of, like I mentioned Trickster and Firehouse and I'm like, those were two that I listened to a lot. And then I started thinking about um, like, did you ever listen to Pretty Boy Floyd? No. I, I've okay, heard so of the name. U, UK, UK rock. Um, that was another one. Um, LA Guns was one there. Granted, they're still yeah. putting out music and, um, and- LA course, Guns was they, a really good band, really good and, band. LA Guns was a really good band. Yeah, absolutely um perhaps even better off as they are than what they were originally which wound up being guns and roses yeah. um yeah so um but yes yeah, it's, it's funny because it's like i i have my my spotify lists and and now i'm thinking i need to have like obscure rock playlist because um because i'm remembering all these just through through talking about all this stuff it's crazy yeah one I would add to to that, that sort of overlaps with the with the glam metal period, and, and, and obviously they were commercially successful. But I actually do feel that they're criminally underrated just because they, their sound was so good, and it was unlike a lot of the other glam metal bands, even though they fit into the genre. Was Tesla? Uh, I always thought Tesla was Tesla, amazing, right. and yes. they kind of just like instead of people thinking that they were amazing, they just sort of said, "Oh, they're part of that scene," and then when the scene yeah. was over, they were over. But they weren't really like a lot of the other glam metal bands. Like they were very rootsy, like blues, hard rock, but it still sounded like the eighties too. And I just thought they were fantastic. And, and some of their songs just give me chills. Like I just think of like the, it just sounds like the late eighties and it's just, it's yes. like they're forgotten today, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and they were actually kind of ahead of curve as well because they would do um, full sets completely acoustic well before MTV ever did MTV Unplugged. Um, and, uh, just like amazing stuff. Yeah. They, they were really cool. Um, Tesla is another yeah. one that, that I listen to still to this day. Um, one that I still listen to this day that would never make it as a band now because of the lyrics that they wrote is faster pussycat. And that was oh, another yeah, one. Okay. Yeah. Cause I mean, all of yep. their lyrics were very, um, sexually descriptive, I will say. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, that would not fly. That would not fly today. Um, but well, yeah, another another uh, band I think that would fall into that. I didn't like them, but they were very popular in their time. Was Jackal? Um, it's I just didn't listen to Jackal. Oh my God! It was just well, basically their their, their big song was just them with, with like a chainsaw, like just you know, you know, just rubbing up a chainsaw throughout most of the song. And some of the most, I mean, talk about unPC by today's standards. It was just the most mm -hmm. dirty, filthy. It wasn't even like funny. It was almost like. Sam Kinison without the humor, you know, it was like just sort of just like a, just, just a know, lot of screaming, filthy screaming. Yeah, of, yeah, and the guy kind of reminded me of Sam Kinison, the lead singer. It was just a lot of, yeah, just, but they were very popular, like for about a year, I would say, like 92, early 93. Like they, they had this one song that just got played, the Lumberjack song, I think it was called. They just got played all the time. It was just the most disgusting, sexist song. And then uh, just, they just went away because they, they really had one shtick and that was it. So that was kind yeah, of, yeah. Uh, Sam Kinison's version of Wild Thing was was one of my <laughs> favorites. 
here. But then again, I loved his, I loved his stand up. He was fantastic. Oh yeah. Yeah. He was a genius. Yeah. Jeez. Um, the chainsaw made me think of Jane's addiction, like caught stealing. Um, that was another, oh, yeah. another great band. Um, yeah. So, well, see, that's also another interesting thing about that time. It's like, you know, you had some, th- you know, I can't think of a better time period where two things were going on at the same exact time. One was music that is so dated to the like 87, 88, 89. There's like, there was so music, much music being put out that is just so of its time that it has to stay in those years, like pretty much. Mm-hmm. And I'm talking about all genres, everything from like, you know, George Michael, which who, who I love by the way, but you know, from yeah. George Michael to like, you know, Steve Winwood and so, I mean, just everything sounded like the eighties, but then at the same exact time, you had some of the most prophetic music happening. Like for example, Jane's Addiction, like you just said, nothing shocking. That sounds like the 90s in a nutshell, and it happened in 88. Like they were right. just way ahead of their time. The Chili yeah. Peppers were way ahead yeah, of their Chili time. Peppers, that's true. Uh, Faith No More was way ahead of the time. And all that stuff, some of their early, their, their early good albums came out like by eight, by 89, those albums yeah. had come out. And it sounded like they just, here's the template for the 90s, guys. Like, you know, and it's just, I don't know. It was like very much like there were some bands that were just way ahead of their time. And then other bands that were just utterly entrenched in the in that time so that they could never leave it. You know, it's yeah, just weird, uh, really weird time of music in the late 80s. Yeah, Faith No More. It was another um, what the heck was the name of the album that Epic was on. But oh, the, um, the real thing, the real thing. OK, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, I man, I listened to the, the hell out of that album. Um, mm-hmm. And and to this day, my favorite track on it is one that they never released. It was. Um, zombie eaters is that what it was called oh, yeah. zombie eaters yeah it's, which, it's a very, it's just, death metal well, kind of sound yeah but i mean it's one of those that it starts off really slow and then gets into it you know kind of thing but um i yeah that that album was that was still still fantastic but but you're right it was definitely they were kind of ahead of the curve and yet when it changed when when they got around that curve they found that nobody wanted to listen to them anymore so um yeah. so yeah that's really crazy but I mean, I'm I'm not like I don't actually the grunge era. I, I was I was very much into it because I mean it it still had the rock sound and it was something new and exciting and um, bands oh, yeah. were doing different different things and I was loved Pearl Jam and um, still to this day wish we could have seen what Nirvana would have been. Um, yeah, um, granted we would be without the Foo Fighters if we did that, but um, but uh, but yeah, it's, it's it's a funny thing that happened is like the grunge era and then music changed again and we ended up with um like collective soul which is still one of my favorite bands and i got all of their albums and everything but then then you know music sort of changed into something that i stopped listening to for about five or six years so there's this void from like the late 90s to like 2005 where um i feel like i'm still learning bands from that era because i kind of checked out for a little bit Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, I kind of went through the same thing where for a long, long time, it's like I just fell off a cliff as far as like keeping track of new music. Like, from yeah, almost the same time from 97, I would say till about maybe 2008 for me. Like there was was an 11 year period where I just was not interested in what was going on around me. But I've been looping back a little bit. And some of the things that I think I I missed out on a little bit. which I, I have, suppl- you know, I, I've, I've replenished myself and sort of gone back and made up for lost time a little bit. Um, I would say a few obvious things. One, even though I was never a huge, and even to this day, I'm not a huge, like, they're not one of my go-to bands, but I have to acknowledge how Radiohead just changed things. Hmm. Like, OK Computer was a revolution, and then Kid A was a revolution on top of that. Like, it was a revolution against OK Computer, which is funny, because OK Computer was enough to digest, and then Radiohead said, let's upend an OK Computer and completely ruin that and start something entirely new. So I think what, what Radiohead did that I didn't acknowledge at the time was they first reinvented guitar rock and completely changed it. And people were thinking like, oh, they're going to do that for the rest of their career. And then they completely threw out the guitars and then basically were prophetic about the 21st century with Kid A about just it being like a, electronic experimental pop. You know, there's there's a lot of that that's sort of has come from Kid A. So that's like one thread that I think I totally missed out on at the time. 
two, there's, there's three that I'm thinking of. Like number two is that, and this I, this I did actually enjoy at the time and it's been a constant source of pleasure for me to this day is I loved, and call it what you want, down tempo, electronica, trip hop, whatever it is. But there were a bunch of bands like Zero Seven, Air, Boards of Canada, Massive Attack, Portishead. I just liked that sound. I like just electronic pop Sometimes it's experimental, sometimes it's more pop, but as long as it's electronic based and has that kind of like down tempo vibe, I just love that. It's almost like the chill out music, like after you went to the club kind of music. It's just like, I don't know, yeah. there's something about that I really like. And then the third thing I think that I, I feel that I do feel like I, I missed out on a little bit was, which is kind of like, uh, um, you know, something I, I, I regret that I wasn't more into is that I think that was also the last um, gasp of guitar rock being popular on a mainstream level like just guitar rock has is just almost like nobody cares anymore and that was mm -hmm. like the last period of time where people did care about like the white stripes um uh the strokes you know bands like that were still yeah. considered mainstream and could still be Which. popular and it just doesn't happen anymore i mean guitar based rock i won't say it's dead because i don't want to you know be, enact that cliche but it's definitely not on the like it's it's on the side now I should say yeah you know? it's, it's interesting because I mean I, okay so I am a fan of the pretty reckless and I'm not a fan of Taylor Momsen per se but I don't know if you've listened to any of their albums or not but no. um yeah but they they definitely have that um late 80s early 90s um, guitar rock sound and I mean she's not the greatest vocalist in the world but she's certainly not bad she brings something she brings some sass to it some edge and they yeah. um they certainly embody the the sex drugs and rock and roll vibe of the late 80s and um and, and with a really good sound too um I think they've I think they have three albums out now something like that yeah um yeah. right well um obviously you know you and i could talk about this stuff forever we could talk about anything forever um yes. and so I, I appreciate you giving the time but uh we'll we'll, we'll call it there um you know I, I hope it doesn't show we've we've had some technical issues whether it happens to be certain people not recording the first conversation or internet's <laughs> not cooperating this time but um but we, we've yeah. had we've had a good conversation and i appreciate the time um Let's yeah. just leave it with, let's leave it with uh, one band you think people should listen to. Well, I'll, I'll, I mentioned School of Seven Bells, but I'll, I'll, I'll do a different one here. Um, just because I came back from Bonnaroo and the most underrated band actually that I saw there that I think people should check out is this band from New Zealand called The Beths, B-E-T-H-S. Mm -hmm. They are amazing. They're very new. But they're guitar-based rock, very smart songwriting, got a good attitude to it. Um, check them out. The Beths are amazing. All right. There we go. All right. Cool. Well, um, as always, good talking to you. And uh, I hope we can catch up soon. All right. Yeah. Take care, man. Take, take you.